Hey, good morning. If you would, stand to your feet. Great day to praise the Lord, huh? We're having a little trouble with the PA today. The guys back there bailed us out and patched it up, so it's a great heaven. Folks who know what they're doing. <laughs>
working now? Okay. <laughs> we would like to welcome all of our online guests, and then we would also like to, to welcome all of our visitors. So if we can give all of our visitors a, a great Believer's Fellowship welcome and let them know that they are part of the family. Thank you all. <laughs> You guys may be seated. We're going to uh, continue to worship now. Yes, this morning we're going to have Regina uh, read, the, read the word for us. Good morning. Today is from Daniel 5, 1 through 12. Belshazzar, the king, held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousands. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and the silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. 
and the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Then the king's face grew pale, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his hip joints went slack, and his knees began knocking together. The king called aloud to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners, diviners. The king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, any man who can read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me shall be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and have authority as third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, they, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. His face grew even paler and his nobles were perplexed. The queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. The queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. This was because an extraordinary spirit knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. Father, we come to you this morning. We just, we thank you so much for this time that we can gather, that we can worship you that we can hear your word, that we can learn it, that we can live it. We just, we just thank you for, for all the blessings that you give us, Father. Just let us, let us hear this message, take it to heart, where it's part of our lives as we go forward. In your holy name we pray. Amen. I 
I've tasted and I've seen come once again to me. I will draw near to you. I will draw near to you. Better one day in your court. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your course. A thousand elsewhere. Better is one day in your court. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your court. A thousand elsewhere. Better is one day. Oh, better is one It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. 
you're a good, good father. Amen. God. Amen. You may be seated. Good to see you this morning. Glad you came to church to worship the Lord. Is this your first Sunday again with us? We're glad that you're here. Our senior pastor is not here today, so don't judge the church by me. <laughs> but we're glad you're here. We're going to be sharing from the Word of God. Thank you, Regina, for reading that first 12 verses. We're going to hit this whole chapter, so if you have a Bible, uh, open it up, or whether it's on your app or whatever, to Daniel chapter 5, because we're going to be diving into this verse, into this chapter, where this king meets this cruel, terrible end. I've titled this message, The Night Belshazzar Got Busted because that's exactly what's taking place here. And uh, I think it's an interesting passage because it so parallels where we are as a culture today. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I've never seen a mass of people in one nation so confused, things so chaotic, such division. I mean, it's, it, uh, it's, these, are, these are different kind of days, folks, and... Uh, uh, if, if you're new to this world and you're maybe in your teens now, this ain't the way it always was, <laughs> all right? But the Bible tells us as we get closer and closer to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen, that things are going to get worse all around us. So the Bible says these things shouldn't take us by surprise. But I think we need to address some things, and certainly this passage is in Daniel chapter 5 gives us some insight. And by the way, Daniel's New Testament parallel is the book of Revelation, and so there's, although there's great prophetic implications in this passage, I'm not going to go to that part of it. Uh, we're going to deal just about where I believe is a real practical and personal word for us today. But this all starts back before Belshazzar is the king with his, really was his grandfather, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, the queen it mentions here is most likely uh, his grandmother. But uh, he's gone on to be in eternity at this point in time. Belshazzar is the, is the potentate and power inside uh, Babylon at this time. But uh, if you remember back in Daniel, there was an image that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream about, and it was an image with a head of gold and then silver and then bronze part of the body and the legs of, 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 of iron and the feet of clay and iron. As Daniel explained, and also as Revelation explained, that describes a confederation of nations, basically, that history will see as time goes by. And the greatest of all these kingdoms, as Daniel explained it to Nebuchadnezzar, uh, was Babylon. Babylon's the greatest kingdom ever known to mankind. There's no kingdom that amassed such property, such territory, uh, had such authority, no king probably ever in history other than the King Nebuchadnezzar had such might and power, whose word carried such weight. Uh, it was an incredible kingdom, and God ended up judging them as he said he would. But because they didn't understand their might and their power and their prowess, came from God himself. And that's brought up in this passage that we were reading a while ago. But let's, let's look at this story. Let me give you a little background of what's going on here in the real practical sense. There's a slate of characters here. There's Belshazzar, obviously. He's the king, uh, the queen mother, the counselors and the wise men. And then there's the friends of the king and Daniel is here. And don't forget this other personality that shows up just by his hand showing. And that's the, the hand of God is it's made reference here. These fingers that ride on, on the slate wall. Uh, Belshazzar, I, I think we want to bring him to a modern-day world. He's your typical American probably guy, you know, who's, got his, who's made his own way, who's succeeded. He has that mindset which most Americans have today is that, hey, nobody going to tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do it how I want to do it, when I want to do it, and you just mind your own business. I'm okay, you're okay, but I'm more okay than you are. <laughs> That's the way it kind of falls down in the culture that we live in. And Belshazzar represents so many people today who, who are, are just walking in arrogance and walking in pride and thinking that all this stuff that's been accomplished in their life has been granted to them by them. Folks, please understand, if you have any authority, any prowess, or any blessing, or any privilege, or any riches whatsoever, those things are given to us by God himself, and we should be responsible to him. But Belshazzar, you know, he's, he's throwing this party, and everybody's invited. And then there's the queen mother. She runs in when things get bad and says, don't sweat it. You know, it's going to be okay. I have an answer. And then there's the counselors. Uh, these guys are the conjurers, it calls them, the, the wise men of the translation. The, these are the, the, the life coaches of the day, all right? They run in and try to answer the problems, but they got no answers. You know, and nothing they can say is right. In fact, they're just as confused as, as Belshazzar is when all this takes place. They certainly represent the humanistic educators and philosophers and psychiatrists and psychologists of the day who ignore the Word of God and what God has to say. 
And then there's the friends. There's a thousand of these people and their wives and their concubines. So there's probably two or three thousand people at this big party. I mean, it is the event of the day. Everybody who's anybody who means anything in the culture, you know, they're there. I mean, it's the top politicians, the top rock stars, the top country stars in a modern day setting. All right. All those people, the, the list of who's who goes on and on. And they're there not only with their wives, but with their adulterous relationships as well. And so you can imagine what kind of party this is, but try not to go too deep into it. I don't want to pervert your thinking. And then there's Daniel. I call Daniel Mr. Cool. Everybody's freaking out but Daniel. King's having a, 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 a place right there where his hips are dislocated, his knees are slapping together, his face has grown pale, he looks like he just died, and, but, you know, and everybody else is the same way. Then Daniel walks in. The storyline is important in this particular passage because ultimately this is a story of judgment. Now, that's not a topic that a lot of people like to talk about today, but I think it's important that we talk about it in the church, that we need to understand that judgment is looming and that there's coming a day on this planet when God's going to judge the whole earth. I know there's a lot of people set back, where is God when this goes on and how can God allow that to happen and how's God... Listen, we're in a world that's controlled, you know, by demonic forces, all right? Satan is alive. He's, the Bible says, the little g, God of this world, right? So here's the devil. He's on his throne. He's doing his thing. So quit pointing your finger at God and blaming him when the true enemy of your soul is Satan, and he's the source of all that's going wrong in our world today and has been the source since day one when Adam and Eve fell and chose themselves and their wills and their desires over what the will of God was. But mark it down. This is a story of judgment, and it's a, it's a good sermon for today because this is Pride Month. All right. But it's not the kind of pride you want to know about. In fact, it's any pride. Right? The Bible says that God will judge the proud. All right? That's it. Pride becomes for a fall. The haughty spirit before judgment. But, you know, again, you won't hear sermons about judgment anymore in church today because I think we're just kind of, at least you'll hear them in Believer's Fellowship, all right? But in the world and in the church as a general, we don't want to talk. I mean, God is love. We just can, and we've so misused and abused that aspect and that character of God that we don't even understand love anymore. In fact, the abominations of this age, which kind of are formulated, recognized, and paraded in Pride Week, those are the very things that God calls an abomination to himself. They're an abom abomination. You say, well, I don't like that, Pastor. It, it, it's not, I didn't write this. <laughs> you know, he wrote the book. He gave us instructions so that we might have a full life and a meaningful life. But we're living again in a perverted age which doesn't know God and doesn't want God and rejects God and takes everything that is before us and changes the meaning of it. I mean, we even change the meaning of love so as to describe our sin. You know, we say, well, it, it, here's the person in, in, a, in a relationship, and it's premarital sexual relationship, and they're having it, and they say, oh, but we love each other. No, you don't love each other. If you loved each other, you wouldn't be acting in such a way because genuine love is not about what you get from a relationship. Genuine love is not about what somebody can give you, but genuine love is what you can do for somebody else. And true love is desiring for that person God's highest best, his highest good, for, and his highest purpose for their life. And the Bible says that true love, according to 1 Corinthians 13, we call the chapter of love, true love does not rejoice in iniquity. I mean, we even do it in the homosexual relationship. Well, we love each other. I guess you Christians don't believe in love or that God is love. You see, they don't understand love. And so they're willingly uh, jumping up and making these accusations based on ignorance and based upon a lack of understanding what real love is. If I love you, I'm not going to exploit you for my own pleasure and my own desires. If I love you, I'm going to be concerned what is best for you. But this is where we are in this culture, and we don't understand love. Love means I will do, and I will sacrifice, and I'll make choices against even my own wishes and my own passions and my own desires so that your best can come forth in life. But boy, I tell you, we just don't understand God. We don't understand God's love. We, we, just, we, we understand love in the context of what the Greeks called, you know, a, a, a sensual love, uh, the, the uh, the, the, the mindset where, what can I get from you? What can you do for me? How can you satisfy me? But we don't understand God's position on this. But here's an interesting passage that the prophet Jeremiah said about God. He said, if you want to take pride in something, let him that glorieth glorious in this. If you, want to, if you want to have a pride parade, this is what it should be about. That we understand and we know that God, that he is the Lord 
And he does exercise loving kindness and judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these things the Lord says, I delight in. God says, I delight in loving kindness. I delight in righteousness. Well, we, we kind of got that. God wants us to be right with him. God wants us to be loving and kind. But God says, this is the way he is. But he also says, that middle word, I delight myself in what? Judgment. We live in a world which likes to talk about justice and judgment and equity and fairness. We have no concept of the word itself either. All true judgment is based upon the righteousness of God. And God is righteous. And God, God in this righteousness is in his son Jesus Christ. And laid upon him that judgment. So that when it comes to me standing before God, that judgment won't fall on me because I've chosen Jesus Christ. And surrendered to his lordship in my life. And accepted it in my heart. And I have this relationship where he, whereby he has forgiven me of my sin. And he didn't forgive me of my sin so that I might stay in my sin. He forgave me of my sin so I could be free from my sin. Amen? But we, we, we don't understand these concepts. And here's the story. The storyline is literally of Belshazzar stepping across that line of God's mercy and grace. And he's, he's vaunting himself and parading himself in, this, in this, this celebration that he's called forth to lift himself up and then not only to do that, but to mock God. It says that he took the sacred vessels from the holy temple, remember, and he brings them into the party. And God says, that's enough. Now, you, please, you, you, you really ought to understand that all of us should understand that there is a point in time, if we don't get right with God, that, that's enough. Yeah. All right? It's going to be enough. God said, you know, it's a point until man wants to die and then the judgment. In other words, we're all going to have to stand before God. But we don't want that judgment to fall on us. It's already fallen on Jesus Christ. And by faith in Christ Jesus and what he's done, I can be free of that judgment. But understand, no matter how you have disguised the abominations of your life, no matter what you've, how you've changed the meaning of the words of those things in your life, sin is still sin. God still sees it for what it really is. But we, we're living in this culture. We, we're, we're crossing the line. We're, we're stepping into what I call tombstone territory. You know? We're just rejected God and resisted God that we're, we're surely going to face the judgment of God. And I do believe that in some ways in our nation today, we're already facing the judgment of God. We just don't realize it yet. So this is an appropriate message, not just because it's Pride Month, but because you, know, you don't have to be a part of that crowd and still be prideful and resistant of God and rejecting God in your life. Say, I don't need God, I'm all right. I take a little God, but I don't want all the God. It just doesn't work that way. So catch the scene again. Here we are, the storyline. Now to the scene, we're at the party. It's a drunken party. Obviously, there's open revelry and, you know, the immorality is going on. It's, it's, it's kind of like any party night at most clubs you would go to in America these days, all right? Everybody's doing their thing, getting drunk. And, and you know, when you get drunk, you just lose your senses completely. Nobody knows that, right? The dumbest things I've ever been, have done in my life have been when I was drunk. The most stupid things I ever said, the most dumb things I ever did were always when I was intoxicated or high on something. But that's what wine does. That's what drugs do. You know, they, they, the first area of our mind and our psyche that's attacked is the area of self-control. Amen? But we're living in a culture that, 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 that it's, it's the same way. It's, I mean, you can't watch a, a TV show, even a so-called prime time, which is supposed to be kind of family on a TV show, which is not, by the way. You know, every show, every TV drama, every cop show, every comedy, almost always ends 99.9% .9 of the time with everybody having the last final scene around some drinks. Well, we've got we to dull the pain. <laughs> you know, we've got to you know, anesthetize ourselves a little bit more. I like what J. Vernon McGee said. He said, you know, that liquor, alcohol, he said, it's, it's always, it, it, it's always a, a temporary prop for weak men and weak women. Do I need to say that again? It's a temporary prop. It only holds you up for a little while. For weak people who think they need something other than what God's given them, who think they need something other than God. Well, I just can't deal with my problems. I know someone who can and you don't have to embarrass yourself publicly all the time. <laughs> but this is, again, the culture. Now, let's, fo let's follow this. 
The, the party's not enough, all right? This is where the big final abomination happens. This is where, hey, you crossed over the line. You know, you're, you're in trouble now. You're stepping into territory that the judgment of God is looming over, and you, you need to be very aware of where you are. Most people are not. Most people are not really self-aware because Satan doesn't want you to become that kind of self-aware. Well, you see that you do, you, you, first of all, that you are empty, and there's something missing in your life. And that, that missing element is you having a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. That that's, that's not in your life. And so what you try to do is to, is I forgot which preacher made that kind of popular illustration, was you have this God-shaped hole in your life, and you're just trying to push stuff into it and to satisfy your, your, your life, but nothing satisfies your life. And this is where Belshazzar is. Because why? Sin never satisfies. Sin never satisfies. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. In other words, it, it, it's a word which literally means not to cease living or cease to be. It's used in that way, but it basically and most importantly means that we're separated from God and from God's will and God's purposes in our life. In other words, here's God and here I am, and what keeps me from getting to God is my sin. Why? God is righteous. God is holy. You are not. I am not. The Bible says we are born in sin born sin. it's a natural thing for us we nobody has to teach us how to lie how to cheat how to steal we just do that naturally and you don't think so you know it's true quit looking at me like you're spiritual all right <laughs> we're separated from god and so we keep trying but here's the problem sin never satisfies it just never it, there's no there's no answer there no matter what you do the, the next level is well the thrill is gone that's how we progress to such sexual immorality, how we progress in such a, in the drug culture to get worse and worse and worse, or the alcohol world. If you're looking at those things to satisfy your life, nothing satisfies. The thrill is gone. <laughs> the thrill has gone away. Hey, nothing satisfies but Jesus. Nothing satisfies like Christ. And you should know, if you have been resisting him, you should know that point from personal experience. It's always got to be something else. It's always got to be, maybe I can add, and this is exactly where, where we are, because when it doesn't satisfy, <coughs> sin always leads to more sin. Here, what does Belshazzar do? It says they were all drinking, they're all getting lit up, all right. Everybody's having a party, but Belshazzar's bored. You know, we got to do something else here. Let's do something else. And so he orders that the holy vessels that were taken from Jerusalem by his father Nebuchadnezzar when they conquered Jerusalem, they stole everything from the temple, all the golden vessels that were used in worship of God. Now, these are sacred vessels, all right? These are holy vessels, the lampstand, the, you know, the, the table of showbread, the, 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 the drink offerings, all of these elements that were part of that. He brings them in. And there's silver objects and there's golden objects in this. There were vessels for catching the sacrifice of the blood offerings to be sprinkled on the holy holies. All this is brought in. And man, not even Nebuchadnezzar did this. And really among foreign potentates and powers when they conquered, usually they always held because of superstition some respect for the other culture's deities and gods that they worship. The Belshazzar said, we need something new. And so he orders that these things are brought in and they begin to pour the wine from them. And as they do, it says they celebrate the gods of gold and silver and wood. And, I mean, and it's just, there's this open defiance against God's holy vessels. There's this open desecration of these sacred items that, that, that are there. And it's just revelry in these things. Why? Because sin always wants more. Sin's like a cancer cell. It just keeps dividing and multiplying. And in our life, if we're, if we're just left unchecked, oh, you may not go to some other extreme that others have because we're always measuring ourselves by somebody else that's worse than us. <laughs> But you have to understand, that's not the way God looks at it. God just sees sin as rebellion against him. But this is not enough. I remember as a kid, my brothers, uh, they were not the best influence on my life. Until later in my life, one of my older brothers led me to Jesus. After he got saved. But you know, uh, there were six kids in our family. And I would always catch my brothers doing something wrong because they were always doing something wrong. And I was the littlest of uh, other brothers. About three and a half years behind the next brother and about five years behind the other brother. And boy, I'd catch him doing something wrong and 
they'd be smoking a cigarette out behind the house somewhere or something like that, and, and I'd say, I'm going to tell Mama. You know, I'd head back to the house, I'm going to tell Mama until they catch me, beat me up, and I wouldn't go tell Mama. <laughs> but I remember saying stuff like this. Well, I'll never do that. I'm never going to do that. I mean, remember the childhood when they see something that's, it was really outrageous that the world was doing that was not right. You say, well, I would, never, I would never act that way. I would never say that. I'm never going to do that. But sooner or later, you find yourself doing that. This is, this is just the way sin works in our life. And we think somehow that we can kind of curb this influence ourselves. But no, <clears throat> sin and Satan and the world all work together in concert. And this parasitic influence upon our life just destroys us and continues to ruin our life. And we end up that way. You say, well, I would never do this. Hey, as a Christian, let me say this. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians that you are the temple of God. You are one of God's vessels. And that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit that you have, that you're not your own now, that you've been bought with the price of the blood of Jesus, and you belong to Christ now. And with this vessel, what should I do? I should not dishonor it. I should honor the Lord with my life. The Bible says mind, soul, body, and spirit. But again, the influence of, of Nebuchadnezzar to bring these things in and start to to pollute even further himself and those with him. And then you got to involve others. I realized before I came to Christ, I was probably one of Satan's better evangelists. I was good at bringing people into the mess, bringing people into the sin. Have you seen this? Did you watch this? Or did you hear this? Or have you tried this? Have you smoked this? Have you snorted that? Have you done this? I mean, everybody ought to do this. I mean, that was my mindset. And without even realizing it, I think somebody put it even more appropriately, misery loves company. And if I'm miserable, you ought to be miserable. But that's not the way we're looking at it. Because first of all, sin, it thrills, all right? It's exciting. I've stepped over a boundary. I've done something I know I shouldn't have done. But here I are. I didn't get killed, so let's try it again. Let's do something else. And we keep stepping over that. And then we start involving other people. And this is the tragedy. When we are with Christ, we're supposed to be involving other people of the kingdom. But we're without Christ. There's that same, same drive in us to have others come associate or fellowship with us in whatever our misery might be or whatever our life might be or whatever our world might be, even though we don't realize we're doing it. But what you're hungry for and what you desire in your life is a real fellowship with God and with God's people and with God's will and purposes for your life. But Belshazzar, he has no concept of this, all right? And what he's doing, he's cloaking this, this, this sin. If you follow the story, he's cloaking it as an act of worship. They were praising the gods. But people still do that today with their immorality and with their sin. Well, I love God, you know. You've seen all the award shows. I've talked about it before. You see all these people in these award shows that the world likes to where they pat each other on the back and give each other awards for whatever it is. You know, they've just done the probably in some movie role where they're rocking around butt naked, you know, and they're, they're using every filthy word in the magazine that you can think of, and they're doing every atrocious act in the movie, all right, and then they get up and hold the trophy and say, I just want to thank God <laughs> for, for, for blessing me with this. It's the same thing. That somehow we can act religious, and that offsets what I just did. You know, you know it kind of balances the scale. I, well, I, I was a bad person, so I'll be a good person. But we don't realize that's not the kind of scale that God uses. Then comes, you know, this idea that it involves other people, but it always invites disaster. You continue to live your life the way you choose to live your life. You can cloak it with the word Christian all you want. But if you're continuing to behave the way you want to behave and really give no concern for what God is thinking, saying, or doing, or what the results might be in some other way, or how it's affecting other people, you're doing your thing. You're going to have to account for that. Every one of us. Every one of us will have to stand. At, the Bible calls it the great white throne of judgment. The tragedy is I don't have to stand at that judgment seat. I can have Christ in my life. I can be freed from my sin. I can have victory in my heart and life. Things don't have to control me anymore. I'm only controlled by Jesus Christ and his lordship over my life. So here's what happens. Sudden interruption takes place. The written words appear on the wall, meany, meany, tickle, you parson. Those are the words, just four words written on the wall. It just says, suddenly by the lampstand, the finger of a, of a man's hand came and began to write into the, the plaster on the world, on the wall. I don't know about you, but that freaked me out. It obviously freaked him out. It says the king, the king grew pale and his hip joints went out. I don't know. I'm old, all right? I know it's like stand up real fast and something not catch right. 
All right, let's see, multiply that a thousand times. And it's, he is so freaked out, his knees are knocking. <laughs> and his countenance falls, and his face grows pale. All right? And he starts hollering, somebody tell me what this means. I can't imagine. Can you just think for a moment? You're in that room. Everybody's lit up to their mind. You know, they're, they're, they're out of it. And all of a sudden, this is a sobering moment. You know? It's like you're driving home drunk and the red lights come on in the car. This is a thousand times worse. All right? The handwriting on the wall. <laughs> Into the plaster. <laughs> Sound effects help, don't they? <laughs> Meanie, meanie, take off, you farson. And the crane in verses 6 and 7, as we read earlier, he grows pale and he calls for a help that really can't help. He loses his composure. Now, this is Mr. Cool. This is, this is in reality, he is the second in command. His father, the king over the whole empire, is off fighting the Medes and the Persians on different battlefronts. Belshazzar is the king here, but he's the king's son, and he's ruling here, and he doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know how to handle this. He's freaking out. Everything kind of goes out the window. Have you ever noticed when you, when you ever really get a time where the Holy Spirit of God is convincing and convicting you of your life? You know, I, I know what it's like. I, I used to call them the Holy Ghost miserables. Now, in hindsight, I was lost. People were praying for me. You know, and the more they prayed for me, it seemed that my life got more miserable. And it just got worse. And that, somebody said, I'm praying for you. I'd say, stop it. You know? I, did, I was just miserable. And, and it's in those moments in the quietness of your home or your bedroom at night when you're looking at the ceiling and you're wondering, what is this all about? Does life mean anything? You look around, you see all the chaos and the confusion, your own personal emptiness. And you, that's in those moments when God starts speaking to your heart yes. and he starts calling you. Right. And you may not even understand the context of, of all that, but you, some, God's dealing with you. Well, the king's at this point where God's dealing with him in a completely different way. And when God starts dealing with him, there's no, there's no room for giggling. You know, there's no room for talking in the classroom. All that goes out the window. It's hard to be macho or flirt with the girl next door when your Holy Spirit of God is on your life, dealing with you about your life and your sin. So he does what, would, what most would do. Well, I get my, get my life coach in here. You know, get, get somebody, get the diviners in here, get the conjurers in here. Get, 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 I, I, need, I, you know, I need one of the prophets to come on and tell me what's going on. Why? One, this is so important that you catch this today, especially if you don't know Jesus Christ. The Bible says the natural mind, that's the mind without the Holy Spirit, cannot perceive nor understand the things of God. So when you look at the things of God, it's confusing. You're not quite sure what all that means. And you hear what the world tells you about those people. Oh, they're just judgmental. They don't care about you. They don't love you. They're just rigid. And, 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 and you, you believe all that stuff because the natural mind doesn't understand. The spiritual mind, the person who comes to Christ, begins to see things differently. Now you're in the light. You, can, you understand what's going on. But here he is. He calls for help. They, they can't help. And by the way, these are the mystics. You know, this is the helpline folks. <laughs> and they can't help. Well, King, it's, um, there's four words on the wall. And here's the words. Mene, mene, tickle your farson. There you go. But it says they also grew pale and they also were afraid and they also didn't understand. What's that mean? We don't know. That help just doesn't help. And then here's the solution. Got to find the man with the answer. Obviously, that's Jesus to start with, the God man. And anybody who knows him, that's who you should be listening to, not taunting. I remember in high school, growing up in high school, uh, we had a kid in our school. Uh, I remember I was a junior in high school that year, and he got saved, you know. And boy, he became the laughing stock because nobody was on fire for Jesus in my school, you know, in high school. But this guy got really committed to Christ. He wasn't ashamed of him. He talked about him everywhere he went. He wasn't afraid to talk to you about him. And everybody looked like, who is this? Well, there were other expletives that were used. Who's this guy? Well, ultimately, he was the guy with the answer. Well, everybody was laughing. The world, again, doesn't understand the things of the Spirit. 
Queen Mother puts it this way. She, she goes in and tells Daniel, oh, Daniel, don't worry. I mean, uh, Belshazzar, don't worry. There's a guy named uh, your father called Belteshazzar. And uh, Daniel, and this guy's different, you know. I think the spirit of the gods, that she didn't understand. This is the way she's speaking. The spirit of the gods lives in him, and he's able to understand deep mysteries. And he helped, your, he helped Grandpa through lots of stuff, so I'm, bring him in. But she's a really good picture of how the devil works sometimes. He always overplays his hand. He always starts with something. Yeah, your life's falling apart. Don't worry about it. Yeah, your marriage is falling apart. You'll get through it. Yeah, things are terrible in your life and your circumstance in your home. It's all right. It'll be over soon. But then Satan always overplays his hand. And she recommends to bring Daniel in. And Satan goes, <laughs> <laughs> that's not what I wanted to do here, you know, in this situation. And Daniel comes in. He does. He is the man with, with the answer. He does come. He has the solution to the mystery. If you look in verses 13 through, through 16, let's read these in, in chapter 5. He says, And Daniel brought in before the king, and the king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you the Daniel who's the, of the exiles from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? I've heard about you. The spirit of the gods is in you, and that illumination and insight and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. Well, he's pumping him, isn't he? Setting him up. But just now these wise men and conjurers were brought in before me, and they made might, might the interpretation and make it known to me, but they couldn't not declare the interpretation of the message. They could read it, can't explain it. But I have personally heard about you that you're able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. So if you're able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, you will be clothed with purple. You'll wear a necklace of gold around your neck. You'll have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. Now, again, he couldn't make him second because he's second, all right? So this fits historically with records other than the scriptures, all right? There's been found lots of historical references to, to these events. Again, you know, they said, well, that just verifies the Bible. No, the Bible verifies that, all right? The Bible doesn't have to be litmus test. It's already passed it. Everything else comes under its scrutiny. So Daniel's called, and by the way, don't miss this, believers. He's called because he has a testimony, if you're, if you're a light that kind of just shines only at church, you have no testimony. Yeah. If you're afraid to stand in public, be heard, be seen, and recognized as a follower of Jesus Christ, they ain't calling you for help. They're calling people who have a walk. And God is using people. This is why it's important to live your life for Christ. They may not want you in the moment, but the day's going to come where they're going to call you and say, hey, can you help me out here? <laughs> I'd like to talk to you. I need some help. I don't understand what's going on here. And Daniel comes in, and he begins to speak, and basically, it's, it's important what he says here. He says in verses 13 and 16, you know, he says, you know, I, I've heard about you, and he says, well, I'm going to make you the third ruler in the kingdom. And basically what Daniel says in verse 17, says, then Daniel answered and said before the king, keep your gifts for yourself. Give your reward to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make known the interpretation to him. I'll tell you what it means. But in fact, when he says gifts, it, it's a literal word in the Hebrew for bride. I, I can't be bride. A man of God, a woman of God, you can't buy them. They're not for sale. You can pressure them any way you want, push them any way you want, try, try to, you know, move them into your little box of how you think they ought to be, how you think they ought to preach, how you think they ought to live, how you think they ought to walk, but they're not going to fit in that box. It just doesn't work that way. And he says you can just keep your bride and folks, by the way, there's all kinds of bribes in the culture for Christians today. And they may be monetary. If you just shut up, you get a raise. If you just don't talk about Jesus, you'll get more money. If you just not talk about Jesus, you'll have better job security. If you don't talk about Jesus, nobody's going to say anything. It'll be just do your thing. Separation, church, and state. <laughs> That's the dumbest thing anybody ever came up with. You can thank LBJ for that. That's not what it means when it talks about that in the Constitution. It means the, the state will not try to run the church. So I can't be bought. Why can't I be bought? Because I've already been bought. Amen. Bought by the blood of Jesus. I belong to Christ. You can be bought by popularity. Well, you know, if you just act this way, you'll be more popular. Other kids will like you more. You can be accepted. You might be part of the group. You might make the team if you just shut up. Just, you know, just keep that to yourself. Daniel says, keep your bride. I can't be bought. And then he gives him the sermon. And the sermon is, 20, is 17 through 24. And due to lack of time, let me just give you the, the outline of what he says here. He said, King, you knew better. You didn't listen. Your father was a great, your grandfather was a great king. 
And he realized that God brought him all that greatness. But one day it went to his head and he became proud. God let him become a madman and he lived like a donkey out in the wilderness eating grass in the field. His body was covered with the dew of the morning. He went nuts. He literally lost his mind. Lived like an animal until God restored his sanity. And then he realized that God is the ruler over all mankind. And he graduates or promotes whoever he will. He had to have a little lesson learned. And he was lowered to this way. He said, but you, Belshazzar, Verse 22, his son, he said, you not humbled your heart even though you knew all this. I think you could break it down to a four-point sermon like this. You knew what was right. How many of you could fall in that category? I know what's right. You knew what's right, but you ignored it. I'm going my way instead. I want what I want. doesn't matter what God says. And you lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And now it's too late. Go to cross for that is kill. <laughs> You're in dead men's territory. You're in tombstone territory. You've crossed the line. It's too late. In fact, the very first book of the Bible, you know what God says in Genesis? He said, my spirit will not always strive with man. Yeah. You keep crossing that line and crossing that line, and God keeps dealing with you in mercy. You've got to keep showing you grace, and you keep saying no to God, no to God. There's going to come a day when you won't hear his voice anymore. The Bible says, he that being often reproved hardens his his neck, hardness, his heart, shall suddenly be cut off and that without remedy. In other words, you keep getting more hard-hearted and more hard-hearted every time you say no to God, and there's going to come a day that you're going to have to pay the price for that. God loved you enough to send his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for you, and you've rejected it. Catch the significance of the words, though. They're, they're important. Mene, mene, tekel, you farsen, in, verse, in verses 25 through 28. He says the word mene has to do, and it's a word that literally means numbered, but he says it's, it's, it's mene, mene, twice, numbered and finished, all right? Your days are numbered and finished. It's over. By the way, did you know what the Bible says about your days and my days? Our days are numbered. In fact, it says, teach us, O Lord, to number our days. What are they? That God's given us appointed time of life, appointed time of death. We should be living for the glory of God. And twice it's given, mene, mene. I mean, you need to understand it's over. No wonder he says, keep your gold. You're not going to have it much longer. Keep your necklace. In any word, Jesus is the word tico, which it has to do with a balance. We think of a balance like the little graphic in the picture there, like the, you know, the, the justice balance we see in the courtrooms and stuff. He says, you've been weighed in the balance and found too light. You know, I used to think of, of one day I would stand before God and be kind of like this balance, you know. Okay, I'm here before God, and he brings the scale of justice up, boom. And on one side, he thinks, oh, Joe, you were a good neighbor, and you helped somebody, and you helped that lady get some gas in her car that day, and, and, and you were nice, and you were kind, you were, you were decent there. So we put all your good stuff on this side of the scale, <clears throat> right? And then let's go over here to the other side. Oh, man, here's a list of stuff you did wrong, and then your sins are listed here. You know, uh, let's, 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 let's put that one, and that one, and that one, and, th and all of a sudden, the scales start going this way, <laughs> you know? Or you hope that there's just an after balance, and you think, hey, if it's like a little bit back and forth, and whew, I can go into heaven. That, that's not the way it works. You see, on one side is all your good, your very best. On the other side is God's righteousness. And your self-righteousness comes up short every time. You are lightweight. There's no, there's no weight in that. Well, the Bible says we can't save ourselves. It's not by works lest any man should boast, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, by God's grace. So what happens over here now, I come to Christ, and you know what he does with this other side? He puts his righteousness in there. The Bible says in Romans that God has given me the gift of righteousness. Jesus gave me that. And now, boom, it balances. You've been weighed in the balance, and you've come up way short. Your goodness, your works, you know, hey, you need to accept the grace that God gives. And then he used this word Paris, which is you parson. It means to divide something. And he says, tonight your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. Well, they were in a battle with the Medes and Persians already. There were front-line wars going on different places. In fact, right outside the city gates of, of Persia, of Babylon, that night, they knew it. there were Medes and Persian forces wanting to take the city. But Babylon was secure. You know, Belshazzar said, hey, I'm living in the most fortified city that has ever been built in the world. Nobody's getting in here. Those guys, they can camp out there until they die. Nothing's going to happen. Babylon was invincible. They said the wall was, eight, this is what historians say, 87 feet, not high, thick. 
87 feet thick, 300 plus feet high. That's a big wall. Amen. 56 miles around is what the archaeologists tell us this city was. And they said, in fact, on top of the wall, that you could ride six chariots abreast around the city. They said, on that wall were 250 watchtowers. And then there was a moat outside that wall with another smaller wall. The Euphrates River ran into Babylon. As it skirted the outside of the city, there was a canal that had been taken off the Euphrates and fed through the city. The city, if they were besieged for years, it wouldn't matter. They had enough food and grain stored and enough water to last them for years. It was an incredible kingdom. It was an incredible force that was there. But the, the Medes and the Persians devised a plan that they implemented that night, and history reveals this. Historians tell us that what the Persians did and the Medes did, they got together and they, they took that canal that was coming off the Euphrates and they dammed it up. They started just damming it, blocking it, so that the water would not flow through the city. And where that canal had fed under the walls of the city, the armies came marching in from both sides in the middle of the night. The time was about right when this was being said. They're beginning to take the city, even in the midst of this party, where you think everything's good, you don't need God, you're secure, you're covered, everything's fine, you've told yourself there is no God. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. The most foolish thing we can do is ignore God. Your kingdom's been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians this night. Already. Let me tell you something about that word already. If we don't know Jesus Christ, we're already condemned. You say, well, what do you mean? Jesus said that in John 3. He that believeth not is condemned already. We already have the wage of sin hanging over us, which is death and judgment. But Jesus said, but he that believeth is not condemned. You come to Christ, the judgment's taken away. Come to Christ, the sentence of death is removed. And here they came, which leads us to the summary. You got a couple of minutes, right? If we wrap this up. Verses 29 through 31, here's the way it reads. Belshazzar gave orders and they clothed Daniel with purple. They put a necklace of gold around his neck. They issued a proclamation. No, Daniel, you now have authority. It's the third ruler in the kingdom. The same night, Belshazzar, the child in the king, was slain. And Darius, the Mede, received the kingdom at about the age of 62. Those are some strong words. That's a short verse in the Bible. That same night, Belshazzar, the king, was slain. It's over. Keep your gold. The Bible says in Hebrews, what is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did when they provoked me in the wilderness. I can remember very clearly when God started writing on the banquet room in my heart and began to show me how I needed him and how lost I was and how no matter how religious I tried to be or good or moral and decent I tried to be, that that wasn't going to hold up in God's courtroom that we were insufficient in ourselves and we needed a savior and we needed a king. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die in the judgment. I shared that verse a while ago. But catch what happens. Go back around verse 5 and it says, over by the lampstand, the fingers of a man's hand begin to write on the wall. Now I'm sure they brought in the holy vessels. There were those lampstands, remember, in the tabernacle and in the temple that gave light, not for God, but for those who did the ministry. It kind of used that same mindset when Jesus said, now you are the lampstand. You're the light of the world. Same Greek word is used to connect with that word menorah in, in, in the Hebrew. We're to be the God's lampstand. In fact, in Revelation, I believe chapter 1, where John is talking about him being caught up in heaven, he says, and over in the lampstand was one like the Son of Man standing in the midst of the lampstand. The lampstand is record. They're just a picture of God's revelation and his mercy. And Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He's the ultimate lampstand who gives light to all of us that come to Christ. And we become lights for Christ in that regard. But I think it's appropriate that there's these fingers. And I would say probably most likely the same finger that are mentioned in the Gospels when Jesus kneels down, remember, in the sand with the scribes and the Pharisees and the woman taking adultery and they're wanting to stone him. And he starts riding in the sand. 
We don't know what he wrote. I have a feeling it might have been, Mine, Mine, Tico, Mitarti. Because they all walked away. Now, that's just my opinion. <laughs> Can't prove that, but I wouldn't doubt it. We know it's the same hand. The eternal hand of God manifest to his son, Jesus Christ. He tells, the Lord does, in chapter 1, as he speaks to the prophet Isaiah, he says, come. This is the Lord speaking to his prophet. Come. Let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white like wool. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be like wool. We have on our lives a very deep, dark stain that can be removed, but it can only be removed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. As Christians, we ought to be able to see the handwriting that's on the wall. All you got to do is just open the newspaper, look at the news. It doesn't matter which network, it's all the same. That we are a confused, ignorant world, blind, reeling in our own mental, moral drunkenness. And the church seems to be going right along with it. I don't know what it is about Christians who think that somehow they've discovered the grace of God and they love to post on Facebook holding their mixed drink. When God says strong drink is raging, whoever is deceived thereby is a fool. Goes on to say wine is a mocker. <laughs> but yet instead of becoming more like Christ, so many in the church are becoming more like the world. Now, you can have your arguments, whatever you want. But, of course, if you study the Word of God and you're open to truth, the Bible speaks very clearly against drunkenness in the life of the believer. Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, for this is God's will concerning you. The lampstand is lit by the preaching of the Word. As we are honest with God, we let it shine in our hearts. I'd ask you today, Where are you in this story? Are you Belshazzar? Just continuing to resist God, do your thing. Maybe you're one of those good buddies of Belshazzar, like sheep being led to the slaughter, just kind of going along to get along because everybody else is doing it. Or you may be like a Daniel. You say, I have made my stand. I don't care what the world says. I'll stand with Paul who said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but that is the power of God and the salvation to anybody that chooses to believe. That's the word of God. Are we just kind of hiding in the shadows, not being the light God's called us to be? Well, the handwriting's on the wall in our heart always when God is speaking to us. I just ask you to be honest today where you are with God. Ask you to be real in your relationship with God. I want us just all to stand with our heads bowed. Father, we come to this moment in this service as we wrap this up. Help us, God, to be honest with you. You tell us if we're going to worship you, we have to do it in spirit and in truth. And all too often, we're just willing to lie and not be truthful. I ask you today in Jesus' name that those folks in this room who've never come to a place to genuinely and really honestly give themselves over to you as their Lord and Savior, that this would be the day of their salvation. Today would be the day of change for them, that you would move into their heart and their life, make them new, make them like you, Father. Only you can do that miracle, but you can do it. You've done it over and over many times. Father, I pray for Christians this morning who are just happy and satisfied to be living somewhere distant in their relationship with you. I pray you draw them back in. I pray you convict them deeply. Bring them to yourself today. And God, that all of our hearts would be tender, teachable, pliable in your hand. In the precious name of Jesus, Lord, we ask this. With our heads still bowed this morning, I'm going to ask you to take a real serious look at yourself. Scripture tells us to do that. It says, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Has there ever been a time in your own personal life where you came to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Where you know it was real, it wasn't just going to church and being a good person, 
But you, you realized you were lost and needed a Savior, and you gave your heart and your life as much as you understood it. You gave yourself to Jesus Christ and started following him. With every head bowed, but how many of you can just say, that's my testimony, Jody. I, I know the Lord. I've given my life to Christ. If that's your testimony, can you just raise your hand and say, hey, that's my life. I do know Jesus Christ. That's you, raise your hand. I know Christ. I'm not ashamed of it. I know Christ. It's my testimony. I've been born again. You can put your hands down. Now, for everyone who couldn't raise your hand in that moment, there's one of two reasons usually right. One, we know we've never given ourselves to Jesus fully. And this is your day to make that right. Or you're that person who's kind of gone through the motions, but you're just not sure if it really, if you really do know Christ. There's, you just live with doubts and you live with fears and you're just not sure and you keep trying and that doesn't work. You just need to come to a place, and this is the day, to just lay it all down and say, this is the day. So, Joe, I don't know if I've done it before. Hey, when it happens, you're going to know it. The Bible says he makes us know. He gives us a knowledge that we belong to him. His spirit bears witness with our spirit, it says, that we are his children. And you'll know. So I'm going to ask you, if you've never given your life, or you've been living with this insecurity, to pray this prayer after me. Just say, dear Heavenly Father, just whisper it to him. He's here in this room. Don't let anything bind you up. Just be free. Lord Jesus, come to my life today. Change me and help me. Make me new. You died for my sin. Forgive me. Take it. Wash me. Make me new today. Just pray that to the Lord. Tell him thank you. Take that moment just to thank him for his grace. It's nothing we can earn. It's in spite of what we've done. It's not because of something we've done. Yield your heart to Christ today. For you Christians that know things are not right with God, how many of you just be willing to say, I need to get it right with God? I know I'm a believer, but I know things aren't right with God. How many of you just say, Pastor, that's me you're talking to. Would you raise your hand? Honestly, is this the day for freedom and victory? Just raise your hand. I know things aren't right. I need to get it right today. Just slip your hand up and down. Just up and down. Amen, amen. Any others? I want to get it right today. It's the same kind of prayer. Just whisper that, Lord. Lord, today, I give you my heart. Today, wash me clean. Today, make me new. We're going to sing a couple of verses. Let me, everyone, just look at me just for a moment. We're going to sing a couple of verses of this song. And I would encourage you to do one or two things. One or three things. One, if your heart is really right with the Lord. Because I can't believe that because I know my own heart, that we're just always walking with God. <laughs> so if things, are, if things are, and you are walking with God today, then you'd make this a matter of intercession in the few moments we have left here and just begin to pray for folks. To be set free, come to life, and come to fullness. If you're a Christian, you know things are right. This is your opportunity to get it right. If we confess our sins, God save us. I'm going to give an altar call here in just a moment. When they start singing, I'm going to come down front. And if you've never given your life to Christ or you're a Christian just want to get some things right, I want you to come and stand around me because we're going to pray together as a group. All right? So one of those three things, I'm really right with the Lord, I'm going to be praying or I'll be worshiping. Or two, there's things in my life, I'm a Christian, I need to get some right things right there. You're going to come and pray with me. Other ones, I've given my life to Christ that you're going to come pray with me and we're going to see God do something special in each heart that's willing to make the hard decision to stand alone like Daniel did if necessary. Let's worship the Lord. You come. I'll meet you down here at the front. Oh, I heard a thousand stories of what big things you're like. But I heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased in that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am it's who I am. It's who I am. And I've seen many searching for answers far and wide. But I 
know we're all searching for answers only you provide because you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am you're perfect in all of your ways you're perfect in all of your ways you're perfect Give the Lord a praise the Lord offering. Amen. Amen. You just don't want to be bell shares. We have a few announcements, and then right after that, we're going to kill the live feed. I have a very special thing I want you to do and be praying for. So, Jason, you come first. Hello. Thank you, Pastor Joe. That was uh, amazing. So, first off, I will go through uh, the announcements, but everything's in here. Uh, Brad told us everything that's important. All the special announcements are in here so we can race through this. I looked. I didn't see where it said Tomball Cougars are state baseball champions, though. So we'll talk to Brad. But uh, everything important about the church is in here, uh, starting with VBS. So registration is now open on the website. Uh, for the. You can go to the church app and register there. We have a list of supplies that uh, Ashley needs for VBS. It's uh, stapled or it's taped up to the windows out there. So take a peek, see if there's anything that you have that we can use during VBS. Um, and she'll be in the lobby by the nursery if you have any questions. And VBS workday is June 22nd. So any help will be greatly appreciated and is needed. So see Ashley for that. There, now I can see. Uh, next Sunday, we're having baptisms. And we may actually have two Sundays in a row with baptisms. Uh, so if you have anyone or if you're interested in being baptized, please let Brad know uh, as soon as possible, and we'll get you on the schedule. Uh, but hallelujah, uh, that's, that's going to be some fun. Father's Day is next Sunday. Invite your friends and family. Let's come and celebrate Father's Day with the true Father. So see you all here. Invite your family to that. Wednesday night, Joe is wrapping up his sermon uh, at 7 o'clock. That's going to be uh, his final sermon on the next level. If you didn't make the first three, or you didn't make the last one, that's no excuse not to be there. Any day in the Word is going to be a good day, so don't let the devil tell you you need to wait till next Wednesday. We'll see you uh, Wednesday at 7, the same time, the youth are meeting next door uh, at 7 o'clock, and you get to hang out with Josh and I. Finally, guests and online viewers, if you'll fill out that welcome card 
in the back seats or you can fill it out online. Uh, Brad's going to be outside waiting to meet with you. He's got a little gift for you. And tithes and offerings. If uh, you, can, you can now tithe with the, the DF app. So if you don't have our app, check it out. Uh, if not, you can do it in person. There's little boxes in the back or by mail. But honor uh, our Father with your tithes and offerings. And then we have a special, very special announcement that I think, Pastor Joe, you're going to come and talk about. Yeah, hold on. Praise the Lord. Amen.